for that. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to another one of these Communities of Practice uh, seminars. Um, I am a member of the Risk Informed Performance-Based Principles and Policies Committee. Uh, the purpose of RP3C is to help modernize ANS standards and modernization has come to mean that risk informed and performance based methods are employed to overcome the difficulties that we all know about purely deterministic and prescriptive methods. We've been calling these methods RPD approaches and this has received special significance uh, due to the enactment of the Nuclear Energy Innovation and Modernization Act. There's a lot of guidance available for IAB approaches, but most people have not had reason to become familiar with this guidance because of conventional approaches still dominate most things that we do, including standards development. I apologize for the background noise. Um, right now, ANS can be considered a knowledge center for RIPD information and RP3C has initiated these communities of practice webinars to enable practitioners of these approaches to share their knowledge and experience. Today, I'm very pleased to have Dennis Henneke of General Electric Hitachi to present on risk-informed deterministic safety analysis for the BWRX 300. Dennis has been working in the area of PRA and safety assessment for 41 years, including 17 years at GEH. He's overseeing the GEH PRA and safety analysis work for both the BWRX 300 and Natrium plants, and is the ANS chair for JCRM. Please, uh, Welcome, Dennis. Uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Kent. Uh, I see your names on there, old friends. Uh, at least know half of you, so that's. Uh, um, and like Pat said, uh, if you have a short question, verification, or whatever, uh, this is. So, I'll jump in during the call, uh, at any time, and then. Um, uh, but if you have long, longer questions, we'll uh, we'll wait till the end. Um, I'm the kind of senior person for GE Hitachi for uh, both BWRX 300 and Natrium. Um, I am on the the side. I'm a tech, I'm on the technical side of uh, GEH, um, and uh, we have a lot of people. A uh, number of them on this call. I think we have uh, G. It's called. Um, I, I'm going to be presenting their work. I'm sure all of them will be very proud to talk up and uh, and present their work because about the X300. Um, so let me let me go through uh, a little bit uh, just on the X300 first, and then get into the risk informed approach. Talk a little bit about the IEA approach. Some of you have maybe heard heard me talk about this in other venues and then uh, talk about the safety strategy that we're utilizing for both uh, the Darlington site in Canada for the X300 as well as the TVA site in, in the U.S. with some, uh, uh, some adjustments to meet the U.S. Uh, requirements. Uh, so the BWRX300 is first and foremost a boiling water reactor. So uh, those of you who aren't familiar with the boiling water reactor, um, it's a lower pressure reactor than a pressurized water reactor because the, the steam that's produced in the reactor vessel here goes directly to the turbine generator to produce electric power. So it can enter back through feed water and compensate. Uh, much simpler design uh, than a, a pressurized water reactor. Uh, and there's pluses and minuses. I was a, a PWR. A PRA engineer for some 24 years, as well as did some startup work for Palo Verde and Sharon Harris. Uh, so I see plus and minus in both. The simpler design does help us in the area of SM and advanced reactors, and you'll see here in a little bit why that. And of course, you have a radio, slightly radioactive steam turbine generator, so you do have to shield that, and you have to uh, worry about that during maintenance activities, but. Otherwise, a simpler design does allow us to get a plant that is uh, risk and simpler uh, than an advanced uh, a PWR. As far as historical, uh, from a, a GE standpoint, we actually have two, two different routes to get where we are today. You'll see the very first reactor that was uh, licensed in the U.S. is the Valcitos 
Uh, that was license number one in the U.S. Uh, for plants. That was a natural circulation plant. Uh, and uh, built several reactors that continue to be natural circulation plants. Humboldt Bay, and I'm sure Mr. Budnitz has some historical reasons why Humboldt Bay was uh, probably not successful, uh, built probably in the wrong location near seismic activity. Uh, but there were other issues with, the, with regard to that plant. And then Dodoard over in the Netherlands, uh, plants that continue to be natural circ. But as we try to increase power, um, the designers felt that force circulation was uh, needed. They went to the BWR 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, all the way through the advanced boiling water reactor, which has still force circulation, but in reactor and internal pumps. Uh, eventually coming back to our design for the ESBWR, which um, was fed from the simplified boiling water reactor, uh, ESBWR, we got back to natural circulation. 100. And if you count that uh, there, there's a of reactors, and that's the X and the X ray our tension on a reactor. Um, so, and for a long time, felt like natural circ was the way to go, and it's especially true for a smaller reactor. Um, but we have, we went away from so the operating fleet, they have a circulation with as far as the BWRX 300, it is, uh, has some first of a kind uh, attributes. Um, but one of the things you'll see on the next couple of slides is we are trying to use proven technology. Using an existing fuel, an existing internals, existing control rods, existing technology in almost everything we do. Um, with a few exceptions we'll, we'll go into. If you were to uh, try, for example, to develop a, uh, an advanced reactor where you had a new type of fuel and you had to go through licensing for that fuel, that does add years to your license. And so we're using the same fuel as the existing fleet. That, that does help us. On the other hand, we're using innovation where it makes sense from a, both a risk standpoint and a cost standpoint. Uh, and I'll talk to you about a little bit about a few of those, although the design of the containment and the, and the steel uh, composite structure I'm not going to get into. Um, mainly the, the thing about the X300 is it's simplified over previous designs, even over the ESPWR. Um, and this results in about a, a, a total, about 20% of a typical a boiling water reactor um, and uh, less uh, what we'll call safety foot uh, smaller amount of components we have to uh, to protect from say a seismic standpoint or high winds um, and so less less capital costs less operating costs overall um, this is a, a layout of the uh, BWRX 300 with most of the major components uh, shown. Uh, the reactor here is uh, most uh, in order to uh, natural as well as reduce over moisture carryover into a turbine generator to help uh, uh, minimize the amount of radioactive steam that might go into the turbine. Um, Everything else here with regard to the control rod drive system, bore injection, everything else here is uh, similar to previous plants. One of the keys is, is the uh, isolation condensers, uh, and we'll get into that here. In, um, so the isolation, uh, there are of them, we'll get into that here in a minute, but if you can make, from a passive standpoint, it's a passive cooling system, if you can make that isolation condenser uh, very reliable, which we have. Uh, that's a key to the overall safety of the plant. Change the design of the isolation. I'll get into that into in a minute. Um, but other than that, this is a simplified version, including the secondary side of uh, a boiling water reactor. The other thing is because it's a 300 megawatt plant and relatively small, 
uh, we we're able to build a much smaller containment. And if you'll notice, this is the first in a long time uh, that we have a boiling water reactor. It does not have a suppression pool. And what we're what, the reason for that, I'll get I'll get into a, in a minute. But that mainly is that the isolation condenser not only supports decay heat removal, but it also supports uh, pressure control in the primary. So we don't have a need uh, to open relief valves or pores uh, down to a suppression pool in order to right, a design basis event or even beyond design basis event. So no suppression pool reduces overall containment size. Um, it does add the need, which you'll see up here on the upper left side, uh, the need for a containment uh, containment vent. Sorry, it's coming up through here. So we do have a containment vent uh, or containment overpressure uh, uh, protection uh, that's needed for the design. Part of the reactor design is, that's important are these uh, isolation valves. Now, normally, in previous design, isolation valves were containment isolation. They were on the containment boundary. We've mo moved them, in all cases, next to the vessel. So there really is very little room between the, the first valve and the vessel itself. And what we're able to do is move a large medium loco events the design base of space, but once the valve goes and can isolate, then pretty much most locas um, are uh, stopped from impacting the safety functions, and so uh, that, that helps us in overall safety. Uh, so these integral valves, one, one beside each other, they're still still being designed. They, they do help us. We isolate the the primary entirely, and you'll see over on the right here now, this is one of the isolation uh, that open up and then to a large, and you can operate these without any operator action uh, in the case of a isolation. You'll also notice two valves here on the re uh, return line. Those norm are normally closed. Um, this is the reliability improvement we have over the year. Um, and those, the valves, uh, one is a safety relay valve, one is a non safety relay valve. Either of them opening, they're both fail safe, will result in isolation denser uh, being opened. Um, so we were able to take what was the pinch point for the reliability for isolation condensers, which a lot of you have heard me talk about software common cause driven by software common cause and digital INC, which was about a 10 minus 4 failure rate. And now we're able to reduce that down to something in the order of 10 minus 7 uh, failure rate for isolation condensers. So we have a much more reliable passive system here uh, with the current isolation condenser system. Uh, the vessel itself, I think I mentioned mo most of this, it's all proven technology, same fuel, GNF2 fuel, same steam separator reviews before, same steam dryer, uh, similar reactor vessel, although a little bit longer uh, and skinnier than our previous designs for the ABWR and ESPWR. It's um, very similar to the KKM site um, and so on. So we're, we're not trying to design this with anything new. If, basically inside the vessel. Uh, the isolation condenser is, although we've used isolation condensers in other plants, such as Dota Ward, we had it in the ESPWR, um, uh, the operating fleet uh, had isolation condensers in the BWR1, but no, not since then. The, and here's a simplified di diagram of that uh, isolation condenser system. Um, I think I've covered all of this here. Um, here's a little more complicated diagram. You can see the isolation condensers. There are actually two sets of heat exchangers, or two heat exchangers per per train, three trains, each each 100% uh, for a, a typical reactor trip. Um, a 33 megawatt thermal can be uh, removed uh, from the reactor. And then you can see here the return valves, the two valves uh, 
uh, two outs here. So all we have to do is open one of the three trains in order to get uh, cooling for a typical event. If it was the event, uh, anticipate transit without cram, then we'll have to open up um, multiple uh, isolation dancers. And again, uh, I think I missed it on one of the previous slide that this here, which can answer not only provides the safety function for removing heat or heat removal, it also is our primary pressure control. With the longer vessel, very large steam space, and a curve close, isolation condenser opens, uh, those need to control uh, the design pressure of the vessel. Uh, there is a non-safety related uh, pressure relief system uh, that's there as a, a defense in depth measure. The pressure control is from uh, the isolation condenser system. Um, and here's just uh, the the actual uh, isolation condenser we tested for ESPD VR. So we have gone through uh, prototype testing of these. There is uh, some additional testing uh, because we have added to the design that was not on the ESPD VR catalytic recombiners. We're going to bottle up primary, and we're going to um, any sort of radiolytic creation of non condensable gases of hydrogen and oxygen in isolation condensers. And so we're adding those in, and we're going to have to do some of that, but um, that is part of part of the design. That is one of the design. The old ESPWR actually had a, a vent off the top of the isolation condensers, a bit of vent off uh, non condensable gas. Um, in order to last for, for seven days, we need to bottle up the isolation condensers and just hold everything within the primary. Okay, let's go through the IAEA requirements. So uh, but just before I get into the safety strategy, uh, many of you who've heard me talk before in this area have I've talked about this doc, uh, IEA SSR 2 one uh, You see on the right side of the diagram here, this is a uh, a listing or uh, that the IEA oftentimes presents as far as their requirements. If you're going to meet the IE requirements, you will go to these documents. There are sheets in these documents, and you're, uh, if you're going to meet those particular documents, you uh, need to meet all the shall statements that are in those documents. Um, so you see the general safety requirements here. First of the, of the general safety requirements documents, and then there are specific safety requirements in a series of documents, including the one that drives the safety case evaluation and design, which is SSR 2-1, Safety of Nuclear plant, Power Plants in Design. Now, SSR 2-1 has a series of requirements, and they are a series of shall statements with sometimes explanatory material underneath. Requirements one are the major, uh, the high-level requirements for management of safety and design. The requirements 4 to 12 are the principal technical requirements, uh, which includes the fundamental safety function development. That's requirement 4, defense in depth, and safety assessment, requirement 10. And then from there, requirements 13 through 42 provide the general plant design requirements, uh, including a requirement to develop a list of postulated initial events, which requirement 16, the analysis of design basis accidents, the analysis of design extension conditions, requirement to perform safety classification, and then the evaluation and uh, uh, verification of reliability of items important to safety. And all of those requirements are part of the safety case. All, of course, there's all you have to meet all the requirements if you're going to meet SSR 2-1, um, but all of those requirement uh, have shall statements. And I put one example here, which is one of the more important aspects of a risk informed uh, safety strategy or de deterministic safety analysis, and that's the development of postulated initial events. And in there, in the requirement 16, it just says postulated initial events shall be identified on the base of engineering judgment 
and a combination of deterministic assessment and probabilistic assessment. Justification for the extent of use of DSA and PSA shall be provided uh, that show the foreseeable events have been considered. Now, so there, there is a shall statement in there. The shall statement says you have to use PSA. In fact, the SSR 2-1 says for a plant and design, advanced plant and design, you need to perform, you shall perform a PSA. The extent of use of that in developing your postulated initial events for updating your deterministic safety analysis, the performance of safety classification and so on is left to justification. In other words, you, you can go, you know, very much risk informed or you can do the PSA more what we've referred to as a confirmation basis uh, later on, or you can be somewhere in between. And I would say for GE Hitachi, we are somewhere in between. We are using the PSA aggressively, uh, but in the end, the, the safety assessment uh, is highly deterministic in the end. Uh, and we, we inform the deterministic safety analysis using the PSA results. Similar to the safety classifications are based on deterministic and somewhat conservative uh, classification. So if you'd like to understand um, a non-US uh, safety case, a safety basis, safety analysis, feel free to open up SS2-1. It's not, it's not that big a document, and you can read the various sections and understand uh, what's being asked. And of course, the Canadians have their own uh, set of requirements that bring in SSR2-1, which are the reg docs, um, so they add to that uh, the requirements, the shall statements, their own set of uh, recommendations and sets of requirements, including shall statements. Uh, but that's that's the basic uh, evaluation. So you can see if you read SSR 2 1 that the risk informed safety analysis that they require in the series of shall statements has a number of things that you can do. Uh, establish the safety requirements, uh, ensure they're met through the lifetime of the plant, establish the possibility of event, initiating events, evaluation of the design extension conditions as well as uh, D, the DSA, safety classification, ensure the, the design is balanced. Um, if that's an interesting one, which we could talk about separately if anybody wants to talk about that one. Um, Additionally, the PSA can be used uh, in the evaluation of practical elimination for postulated initial events, if you want to put together an argument for that, uh, so that it doesn't have to be a part of your safety case, uh, whether you have sufficient defense in depth, and whether the layers of defense, defense in depth are sufficiently independent. Uh, SSR 2-1 does not require layers of defense to be and fully independent, they they use the word independent as practicable, uh, and you have you can justify that, and the PSA can be used uh, for uh, for that. So, in that the PSA, there are part of these that are, include the shall statements, like the possibility initiating events that says you shall use a PSA to support these. Definitely, items one, two, three, and five are uh, shall statements requiring the PSA safety classification. Uh, item four does not require you to use PSA. Uh, says you can use it when appropriate. Uh, so it allows you some leeway. SSR 2 one allows you some leeway in what you will use a PSA for and what you won't. So let's get into how we implemented this at uh, Gia Tachi. Um, first, first and foremost, uh, we have a full scope, all modes, all hazards, PSA. Some of it at this point in design is, a, is simplified, uh, whereas other other parts of the analysis are pretty um, pretty complex. We have a seismic PSA, and of course seismic, uh, heard me say it before, seismic winds for advanced plants. It is it is the higher risk of, of any of the hazards, um, and it is an important aspect of our risk-informed design. But we, since we have the PSA, we've had it for 
from the beginning of developing the uh, X300, um, we have used it to inform the design. And that's part of the first requirement is establish design and ensure the design is, is maintained safe throughout the lifetime of the plant. Um, and I've just listed a, a few of the items here. I know Nathan Duquette's on the line. He's been somewhat embedded with our design team, has worked very well with them to make sure uh, we help um, help answer questions with regard to risk. It is not a risk-based design, it's a risk-informed design. So we, we work with the design team to help them lower risk when it, when it makes sense um, and then try to weigh the options with regard to cost and risk uh, when there may be a trade-off involved. Um, but the key ones, I would say, the filter, uh, filter containment event was important, the need for an additional uh, non-safety-related RPV depressurization mechanism uh, was important. Uh, boration, we have a non-safety, or well, we're proposing a non-safety-related uh, boration mechanism, a boron addition, um, just in case there's a, a rod binding for all control rods. Uh, we have multiple ways to drive the rods in, but if that doesn't work, uh, boron addition uh, can be used for that uh, very low-risk uh, scenario. Um, we have evaluated flex. It's not as important as you can imagine for an advanced plant, but uh, we, we have evaluated the, the use of it and what functions that can provide. Um, we've had, we have a fire PSA. We can, we're revving it now. We've looked at some uh, spatial separation, including uh, sp separation of non-safety related cables. Um, uh, and then one of the bigger items here is the bottom left seismic capability or uh, capacity uh, for the, I would say there's five, uh, five primary uh, component groups uh, with simplified reactor like the X300. What are the capacity of those component groups? What's, what capacity of the isolation condenser do we need of the isolation valves for the vessel, the vessel itself, internals, and containment? Uh, what capacity is needed in order to bring the risk down uh, so that we have a balanced risk profile uh, so seismic isn't isn't 99% uh, of the risk or we're not uh, getting close to the uh, good safety goals for the plant. With regard to SSR 2-1, um, you'll see in there uh, a reference to an, another IEA uh, document. Uh, that describes the five levels of defense and depth. And this is similar to what's described in the NEI 1804 for the licensing modernization uh, process. We have implemented a formal uh, evaluation for defense and depth uh, with five layers. Not all five layers are required for all postulated initiating events, um, but there are certain uh, rules and, uh, that we Im implement uh, for for example, if you have uh, anticipated an op operational event, uh, or AOO, um, uh, you should have a defense line two system that prevents the operation of defense line three system, which is your safety related system. Um, it's not a shall statement; it's a should, and and we try to implement it in that regard. If you have a a lower uh, def um, probability or frequency event uh, that may be, say, in the DBA range, there is not a requirement to have a defense level two system. Uh, we would we'll utilize one if it's there, uh, but you have to have a defense line three uh, function or a safety related function. Now, if you evaluate the safety analysis, what you're doing is uh, analyzing these posture initiating events. Um, with uh, the plant response under defense line one, which are the things that try to keep your operational, uh, things that try to keep you uh, uh, from having an event in its, by itself, but then that actuates defense line three systems and you still have to meet your performance criteria utilizing defense line three systems. So that deterministic analysis still is a requirement, even under LMP uh, and IEA, risk-informed approach. From there, if Defense Line 3 fails, it goes into what's called a design extension condition. 
And then depending on where you end up, uh, you would have a defense line 4A or 4B, depending on whether you have uh, potential uh, fuel damage or a severe accident event. And then finally, defense line 5 is your uh, emergency planning or flex systems and so on. So we have a very formal uh, listing for each possibly initiating event. Um, and that evaluation uh, that we utilize uh, for all that goes into what we call the a fault list or fault evaluation. <clears throat> this is, believe it or not, the simplified version of our of fault evaluation or safety strategy that implements what I what I've described. And what you have are the hazard evaluations. Unfortunately, under IEA terms, it, uh, something would, would be an internal event, like a, a loca would be a still called a hazard. Uh, or loss of feed water event that's still called a hazard. All these hazard events go through um, an evaluate deterministic evaluation and a probabilistic evaluation in order to develop uh, input to uh, the fault list or the uh, partially initiating event development. Now, partially initiating events are not just those simple events like a loss of site power or loss of feed water event. They also include um, as other events such as human-induced events, uh, all the hazard events and combinations of hazard events, and as well as complex sequence of events such as uh, loss of offsite power followed by failure of all your diesels, station blackout, right? So that station blackout event or a loca with a failure of software, software common cause, these complex sequences, we, we have those in the PSA, of course, uh, but those end up being evaluated and added to the postulated initial event as complex event sequences. We also have severe accidents that come out of the level two uh, PSA uh, that are beyond design based for design extension condition that also go into that evaluation. So the fault list itself is a long, a very long list of potential uh, events that can occur either in uh, AO space, design-based space, or beyond design basis region, uh, all the way through severe accident space that need to be analyzed within your safety case. And you can see now, the although the PSA is shown off to the right, uh, these, the deterministic and probabilistic analysis have to work hand in hand, and in fact, uh, they need to match. And these events, uh, the frequency evaluation, uh, the list itself, uh, they need to, to match uh, fully. I remember in my previous job at, at Duke Power, I did a comparison of the PSA uh, initiating that list versus what was in the Chapter 15 of the Safety Analysis. Uh, and I see some, some old Duke folks here. And, and it turns out uh, that the list was about 80% overlap. Uh, but there were things in Chapter 15 of the safety analysis that was not in, that were not in the PSA or the PRA. And there were a number of things in the PRA that were not in the safety analysis. Well, we can't, we can't have that. Um, they have to, if it's in the PSA and we show it to be, especially in the design basis region or above, we have to have that on the fault list, and it has to go into the safety analysis. In the end, what you have is not a typical Chapter 15 analysis. It's not a list of 20 events or 25 events anymore. This fault list is for hundreds of events. Now, we, we can simplify that down into the postulated initiative in groups, but it's still quite a large list in comparison to what we've had in the past. So it's quite, it's quite complicated. Um, luckily, with a, a, a simple uh, advanced reactor like this, the response to many of the events are very similar. So what is defense line three for one event is often defense line three for three quarters of the events that occur. Um, so we have a very similar response to, to many of the events and we just have to make sure that those defense line three systems uh, can 
are capable to withstand the possibility of initiating events that we discuss, such as um, high winds events or flooding events or whatever they happen to have, happen to be, or seismic events. Uh, in the end, all of that, that fault list, uh, the PSA and all that, that, that feeds into the deterministic analysis, safety analysis, which I, I won't go into, um, which includes not just a single chapter 15 type analysis, but a series of safety analysis that is performed. So like I said, that's the simplified version. Um, it, it's actually a little bit more complicated than that, but uh, the, uh, just remember that the PSA and possibly initiative list that's input to the DSA, um, they have they have to match. Uh, and that's one of the keys to, to this overall analysis. Now, I created this uh, diagram, and I'll, I'll show you in the next diagram, the next page, a comparison between the IA approach and LMP. But um, when I looked at the, when you look at the licensing modernization project process, LMP process, the, the major three steps that we always have to go through are these licensing based event evaluation or list, which we're calling under IEA, postulated entertainment list. Then you go through safety classification, then you do a defense and depth evaluation. Of course, you saw that there were a lot, there's a lot more to it than that. But when you look at it there, under IAEA, everything comes in and has to be justified deterministically. Uh, but on the other hand, the, the PSA uh, under IAEA approach has to confirm the, the, the PIE list, the license based event list, and it has to confirm defense and depth adequacy. And, it, and you saw earlier in my earlier slide that it can be used to inform safety classification. You can be more aggressive on a risk informed standpoint and use PSA to adjust your safety classification. Um, so you can turn that, that middle uh, arrow on the left here from the PRA into confirmation or adjustment or whatever you want, but the base requirements are to inform the safety classification. Look for outliers, did I miss anything? Um, but under the IEA approach, you can, and you probably will be, somewhat conservative on your SSE classification. Um, so that's the three major steps we look at, and obviously there, there are other steps, but that's kind of a one way to, way to look at that. If you compare that with the way we're doing, say, the natrium plant under LMP and other plants going through the lysine modernization, the PRA or PSA is used as the basis for um, the lysine based events, SSC classification, defense and depth, with the caveat that the PSA develops all the inputs, the deterministic analysis still must agree with uh, the SSC classification so that you still have those design-based events or design-based accidents that you have to analyze and you have to show that the plant remains within the, uh, within the safety function requirements uh, and the parameters are, are below what you're, you need them to be in the safety analysis. So you still need to confirm that, but um, still it comes from the PRA. And the other thing under LMP is you have integrated a decision-making panel, it's my last bullet here on the bottom, that is used to review these categorizations and agree or confirm that they believe that those to be uh, reasonable. Um, so if the, if the PRA performs something, gives a safety classification for a component, and then the, the integrated decision-making panel reviews the assumption of the PRA, the scope of the PRA, and says, wait a minute, we think you're, uh, you're missing something here, they can actually classify something higher um, or require additional defense in depth or add a possibly initial event, for example. So the IDPP is what makes this a risk-informed process. It's not everything is depending fully on the PRA. But you can see the steps 
you know, there's more steps than this again, but the steps are somewhat similar, but uh, the IA approach, the basis is fully, you know, determined to separate a confirmation uh, from the PRA and with that LMP approach, the basis is the PRA with confirmation from the deterministic side. Um, so when, once I started thinking about that, yeah, they look a little different, but in the in the end, ninety-five uh, percent what we do under LMP is similar uh, under the risk-informed IE approach, um, and I would say that uh, you get very similar results. Uh, with the single exception, I think I've already mentioned, is you probably get somewhat conservative SSE classification with the IEA approach over what you'll get under LMP. Um, so I finished in, in time for, for questions, but you know I think you've seen what we wanted to present here. We're excited about the X300. I, we have a lot of our, my team members here that have uh, done all this work and are continue to working on this. We're all excited about the X300 and, and building an actual real plant in at the Darlington site in Canada. <clears throat> uh, it's, it's a smaller version of the ESPWR, but it's it's simplified, but it's lower risk and uh, more more cost effective, we believe. Uh, and hopefully the when we build one and build the anth anth kind, that'll that'll prove out pretty well. The key to design three train isolation condenser with two uh, return valves uh, normally closed that fail open. Um, that all you have to do is open those and isolation condenser works. Uh, that also not only provide cooling, but provide pressure control. Um, and that said, since we're building out, I did mention one of the reasons we're using the IE approach, we're building most of our units outside the U.S., and the IE approach is going to be uh, something that's accepted around the world. Uh, so we're looking at plants beyond, you know, the, U the U.S. plant will be the hopefully the second plant built in, uh, in Tennessee at the TVA site. Uh, but beyond that, we're looking at Poland and the U.K. and other, other European uh, countries. So... Uh, this IEA approach uh, should allow us to take this and make, take the safety case to those, uh, those countries and, and apply it um, throughout. And lastly, many of you know, you know, being chair, ANS chair of JCNRM, we are and we continue to be uh, PRA forward. We, we have all modes, all hazard PRAs for everything we do, and we're pretty gung-ho on that, and we're pretty excited about that. So... Um, but that really helps us in implementing a risk-informed approach um, for our design. Uh, that is my presentation, and I'm happy to take questions. I see oh. Sunil, my old friend Sunil is on. Uh, go ahead, Sunil. Yeah, I'm, yeah, thank you. I wrote down two questions. Oh, by the way, I'm Sunil Virakuri. I'm the senior level advisor in PRA. Uh, for operating reactors, but I do uh, um, watch and learn about uh, what's happening in the advanced light core reactors. So let me read uh, for the audience the two questions I wrote. Uh, the first one is I was asking Dennis whether he could uh, speak to, uh, at a high level, the, the, uh, the scope and the quality requirements that you would need during the design phase to support the kind of work that you just described, Dennis. Uh, and, and I'm assuming it's less than what you would need further down. Can you um, talk about that uh, and, and enlighten us? And I, I'll tell you the second question, then I can, you can answer both. Uh, when well, I, let's when let's you, hold off when on you, the second question. Oh, yeah. the, are you talking scope? Are you talking about hazards? Or are you talking about level one, level two? Both. When I, case, I, I yeah. So yeah. So the IEA does in performing the PSA, it's all modes, all hazards. Okay. What you need at CP stage is up to the country. So okay. for for Canada, uh, I think it's very similar to the US. They're not requiring all modes, all hazards. Uh, we are performing it, but and we're doing level two. And currently, the IEA has no level three guidance. They they've just kicked off a project starting next year for level three. Uh, but they do not require level three, so it is level level two, not not lower level two. Okay, 
Okay, go ahead with your so second I, I think you kind of answered my second question because it seems like, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, with, with those two fabulous graphics, how the two uh, frameworks compare, but I believe for the IAEA, you only require a level two, whereas for the LMP, you require a level three. Am I, have I understood it correctly? Yeah, LMP, um, a full implementation LMP doesn't require a full level three. It requires dose, um, dose evaluations for offsite dose. It's not, you know, you don't have to do the economic release and, and others. So it's, it's a level two plus almost a full level three. three. So yeah, that is a, a bigger difference because the metrics that you use for acceptability for LMP are definitely dose, offsite dose. Thank you. Matt. We uh, do have some comments that kind of were in the chat before the hand raising. So I'm not sure if you want to address those first or if the hand raises are quick ones. Um, for instance, Let's, like Steve Nisbet's comment has been in there for a while. Um, I can read that if you would like. Uh, we, it, it got answered, actually. Okay. Um, Nathan yeah. answered it pretty well, so I don't, I don't think you need to go through it. Okay. So if you, if you don't know Nathan the cat, I, I've been taking credit for his work for the last two years, so he's really the brains behind all this all this good looks. He's the, he's the <laughs> brains behind it. Uh, oh, shucks. <laughs> And, uh, uh, go, go ahead, Matt. Uh, thanks, Dennis, uh, and great talk. Uh, I was curious, kind of building off the last question, uh, what does GE view as the rate limiting step for submittal of a construction permit at this point? Is uh, Are you uh, still think there's more design work to be done uh, with the X300? Is it uh, still trying to round out some hazards on the P PRA? Uh, deterministic safety analysis, what's kind of the long pull in the tent as you move towards the construction permits in middle? Um, so we we submitted a construction permit uh, for, although it's a, a different name under in Canada last year, so we're already there. Um, and we continue to work work on the design. There There are items we have to complete um, probably prior or prior to approval of the construction permit, but um, for the primary uh, reactor coolant system and the primary functions, um, what's not designed are requirements. <clears throat> so, for, for example, as a uh, vessel isolation valves are pretty critical to the overall design. The exact design of those valves is not uh, fully complete because we haven't gotten a vendor. Uh, to fulfill the requirements of that yet to, to show us the exact design on those. So there's still design work continuing, but we believe there's enough there in requirement space that we can submit a CP application at this stage. So, you know, people say 30% 30, 30 or so, 40% complete on design, but as far as the safety-related components, um, the, I don't know what the number is. I don't know, Nathan, you guessed seventy-five percent. Am I am I far off on that one? Um, I was typing a, uh, a response to a chat, so I, I failed to hear the question. <laughs> how how far do you think on safety related components were completed? Like for the TVA CPA, when we submit that, how far on the safety related components will be will we complete in design? Oh. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, th I think that's. Yeah, I think that's where we're yeah. So it's not fully, not it's not still fully complete. There, that makes sense, Matt. Uh, I'm not sure. There's a chat one. My determinist today's uh, fail. SSC has failed in the most tenable way. Um, I don't know. It's not exactly accurate in the way we do it. Uh, it depends also if you're in DBA space or not. Um, no, Nathan's already typed an answer to that. So, okay. Yeah, that's what I was trying to type in the, in the answer to it. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I think we're back to the hands. Fred, go ahead. Hey, Dennis. Thanks for the presentation. Great presentation. Thanks. 
Thanks. Um, I'm interested in, you know, in using this, like, uh, I guess it's risk-informed deterministic safety analysis approach. Um, do, do you have flexibility in this approach to sort of risk-inform, like, design, not just safety, like, SSC classifications, but um, design criteria, like, acceptance criteria, limit states, this sort of thing? Like, I'm thinking seismic design here, so... You know, you might have a, a reactor building that is safety related, but, um, you know, if if it's credited safety function doesn't require it to remain elastic, then maybe you could relax the, the limit state criteria to allow some cracking and, and elastic behavior. Does, does your does this method that you outlined allow that sort of flexibility? So if you saw the IEA slide, there's a series of requirements that. Um, probably not uh, under the IA approach, you could not use risk to, to get away from. Those are really the high, higher level functions and requirements. If you go down to what you're talking about, uh, that sort of thing, that's country specific, right? So it depends on how flexible the country is. Uh, Canada uh, falls into kind of the middle of the road, bring me a rock, you know, pro provide me justification. And if it makes sense, we'll, will allow for some risk-informed changes to the basic set of requirements. Um, so it depends, depends on the country and the flexibility. If you were to go take that to Finland, probably not so much, right? So it depends on, depends on the country. Most countries are reasonably flexible. Yeah. Thanks. Appreciate it. Looks like uh, Bob Bundit's put his hand down. Um, not sure if that was intentional. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Fred Grant asked, asked my question. Okay. No. Um, well, we Any have questions? a couple more minutes. Any other questions? Well, Pat, can you hear me? Very well. Uh, uh, Dennis, thanks for the presentation, and uh, thanks for everybody to carrying forward when at this program while I'm away in India. But I just wanted to point out, Dennis, that uh, the connection between the risk-informed and the performance-based approaches, that where all this design requirements in the BWR, uh, GE BWR design uh, focuses on reliability in your safety case, you can construct the same safety case using margins margins to acceptable levels of performance uh, of the various functions, systems, and components, and get to the same place. And to me, it seems like the decision-making would be far simpler if you used margins instead of reliability as the parameter of uh, decision-making choice. Um, yeah, interesting, interesting concept, Prasad, but I, I would say that the way that the IEA has established it, performance criteria, our, there, there are performance criteria in the lower level requirements area, such as reliability goals and so on. In one of my earlier slides, I said, you know, the PRE has to be used to establish uh, what the reliability goals are for, for components, and then you get into performance base. Similar, there's performance criteria under fire protection and other sets of requirements. But in the overall safety strategy, the approach you, you mentioned is not one that would be uh, justified under the current IEA SSR 2-1. So one could do it that way, but the SSR 2-1 is not structured that way. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't be successful in a licensing approach. Again, wouldn't that be uh, country specific? Because in the US, we do recognize the validity of the performance-based approach and margins uh, uh, would be completely acceptable uh, given the commission directions uh, to the staff on uh, risk-informed and performance-based uh, applications. It would, if you're applying SSR 2-1, it would not be country specific. No, it's, you would meet those. Um, and this margins approach, let's say seismic margins and so on, 
whether you would call that risk informed or whether you call that performance based, it's a matter of semantics because they risk informed and performance based have a lot of overlap between each each of them. So those of us who are risk assessment engineers would call that a, even the margins assessment for seismic a risk a risk informed approach. But again, a matter of semantics, I think. Okay, thank you, Dennis. Thanks a lot for everything. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, we have one more minute, and uh, I don't think we have any more comments. Uh, Kent did have to uh, log off. He wanted to make sure that I thanked uh, Dennis on behalf of him and RP3C for this presentation. Um, looks as if uh, we are ready to close this. So I also want to thank you. And uh, this presentation will be up on RP3C's uh, Community of Practice website, possibly later today, if not later today, tomorrow. Um, thank you all very much. Have a great weekend. Bye. Thanks, Pat. Thank you.